So um, if you've been with us over the last month or so, um, you'll know we're in the midst of a series um, as part of our Arise theme uh, for uh, what we sense God is doing at the mi- um, in our midst at the moment. And, um, and just to recap, uh, when, when I was praying about what it is that God is doing in an overarching sense in this season, I really felt that God was saying, arise. And um, we know what a season it's been with COVID and some of the other challenges that we've experienced as a community. Um, and God was, was actually speaking to me about his heart intent in this season. And he was telling me he was causing things in our own lives and in this church to arise. Um, And um, we've been pressing into that as a team um, and um, we've been asking God, so what is it that you're arising over? Um, And one of the things that I would also sense that God was arising over in this season was the eagle's nest prophetic word that we've had since really 2003 when a gentleman called Bob Jones came here and shared that that Kelowna was one of three eagle's nests um, in the northwest region, Reading, um, the city of Reading being one, um, Albany being another, and Kelowna being another, and that um, the type of nest that Kelowna was, was we were an eagle's, a prophetic eagle's nest. And so in recent weeks, I've been sharing with you some of what uh, our team has been kind of processing, praying about in terms of uh, our understanding of what it is to be a prophetic eagle's nest as a community. And we've been unpacking this more and more. Um, I don't know how many of you will remember two years ago, literally this Sunday, two years ago, the last Sunday of November, uh, we had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit happen on a Sunday morning. How many of you were here for that? Yeah, numbers of you. And if you recall, we had a beautifully wonderful worship um, uh, set um, that happened. And then as we normally do, someone got up and gave the notices. And during the notices, God zapped them with power and they were unable to give the notices. You remember that? And, and we were like, what are we going to do? God's really showing up and touching people. And we were like, well, let's just press in. And for, uh, from then to the rest of the year, there was this beautiful outpouring of God's presence that happened in our midst where God would literally hijack our services. And by the way, I've got a little bit of uh, feedback going on here. Um, So yeah, it was wonderful. So this service two years ago was the anniversary of what happened on that Sunday. And um, I want to share a little bit about this because I've never, I think, openly shared this, the back story of what happened. Um, in April 2017, I think it was, or two, yeah, 2017, um, a, a gentleman in the church had had this unusual experience in the night in which God had spoken to him and given him a, a word for me as senior leader that I was to actually focus on resurrecting this word over the church, the eagle's nest word. Um, and the, the sense of word that this gentleman brought um, or, or heard the Lord speak to in this encounter, um, and he didn't know if it was a vision or some kind of thing, but it was a very powerful thing that happened in the night um, uh, to him. He said that uh, I was to focus on resurrecting the eagle's nest word. And if I didn't, Um, actually God was going to move me on. And so he brought me this word. um, And we have a process, and we've had a process in place around weighing and testing things that that people bring around the prophetic, uh, which is a a healthy thing which the Bible encourages. And and we put this word through this grid of, of things, and the weighing and testing team weighed it up. And the sense we had was that the word that the gentleman had brought wasn't accurate. Um, And so we went back to this person. We said, God bless you. Thank you for trying. This is why we we, we don't think it's quite right. We actually think we're going after this. Um, And uh, we believe that we are trying to steward this word over the house. Um, And anyway, it was left like that. We moved on. And I received from three separate people, two of them not in this church, the same word 
three other times to me. And if you know anything about how God talks to people, when he says something on repeat, we're called to pay attention. And so by the third time this came across my radar, I was like, all right, I got this wrong. Um, I'd better do something about this. And this was a process of of a a year and a half um, of determining, actually, I got this wrong. And the um, last Sunday of November, two years ago, I went back to this gentleman in the prayer room prior to the service, and I said to them, I need to let you know I got it wrong. This is a word from the Lord, and I repent. Would you forgive me for getting this wrong? I receive this as a word. And so 40 minutes after this, we're worshiping, and the person gets up to give the notice, and the presence of God comes on them, and there's this outpouring that happens. And I am aware that this outpouring was pertaining the call and the destiny on this house. It related to this word over the church. All right. That was that outpouring. And it was, um, and so I believe what we're doing in this Arise series in talking about the uh, prophetic destiny over this house is significant to what it is that God wants us to do as a community. This is serious business, um, and it is exciting business, and the more and more we press into this and grow this and unpack this and, and set up structures and things in place to steward this word in the way that I believe God wants for this season, the more and more of that life that we experienced in that Sunday won't just happen on Sunday mornings, but it will become part of our destiny yeah so lord do that we pray we want that we want more of you we want more of your life both in and through us as a community lord we want to align with the call on this house to be a prophetic eagle's nest and lord as i share the message this morning that is meant to unpack something of what the prophetic is, that, Lord, you would be in our midst, that you would be speaking to us, and that you would grow us all for the glory of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about the languages of God. Um, So God's first language isn't English, nor is it Hebrew. Would you agree with that, yes? Yes. Um, And if you've ever heard or learned new language, I was terrible at school at learning languages. Um, My mother's Finnish, my name is Matti, uh, M-A-T-T-I, it's not Matthew, abbreviated into English, it's actually Matti. Um, And my mum tried to teach me Finnish learning uh, growing up, and I could never learn Finnish well. I knew it when she was shouting at me and telling me off in Finnish, uh, but I never quite understood what she was yelling at me when uh, I was a kid. Um, and that's something true about languages. It's, uh, most of language isn't actually communicated, or most of communication isn't actually in what is said, but actually it's in the heart of what's being said. And, and as uh, a prophetic community, and by the way, I've said this time and time again, um, the New Testament church is meant to be a prophetic community. We are meant to have the voice of God in our midst. We're meant to be the voice of God to the world. And um, the type of voice we're meant to be is, is the type of Jesus to the world. It's really our Jesus job is to, to communicate Jesus to the world. And it's not just in what we say, it's what we do as well that shows people who God is or who Jesus Christ is. That's part of our prophetic call. And so a lot of communication isn't actually what is said, but nevertheless, language is an important part of communication. Um, And so today I want us to look at a passage that touches on five different channels that God talks on in the Old Testament. Um, And if you want to Turn in your Bibles if you've got them with you or on your uh, phones. I primarily use my phone now as my Bible, um, but I've brought my 
Revival Bible today because I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, and so Numbers chapter 12. Let me find this, trying to multitask. All right. So, Numbers uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he'd married an Ethiopian, Ethiopian woman. Um, and let me explain the backdrop to this before we get into the five different channels, because I'm going to take advantage of this um, passage just to talk about some kind of churchy leadership type stuff here and this is kind of your added bonus uh, that goes along with the the dish i'm serving up today but it's helpful and it's useful and because it's here i don't want to actually miss out on this opportunity of some nuggets that are actually in this passage but the backdrop to what's actually going on here so moses the leader of israel who has on his leadership team his uh, sister miriam and his uncle i think it is uh, aaron Um, And they're part of his core leadership team. Um, And they're upset because either Moses has married a second wife and they don't like the second wife that he's married, or they're referring to Zipporah, who is the daughter of of the Midianite uh, priest that Moses encounters in the wilderness during his 40 years of wandering. And and commentators go one way or the other. They either say this is the second wife or this is actually referring to uh, Zipporah, Moses' first wife. doesn't really matter. But the the thing I want to highlight to you is they're upset at the wife that Moses has. And instead of actually going to talk to him about what they are not happy about, they actually begin to subtly undermine him in the eyes of people around him. So verse 2 it says, So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man of Moses was more humble than all the men on the face of the earth, which is one of the most ironic verses in the whole Bible, because who wrote Exodus? Moses. Yes, I'm the most humble person on the planet. Yeah, which is irony. But it's the word of God, so he couldn't lie. Interesting. Anyway, so instead of actually going to Moses, which biblically, and and when you look at Matthew 18, um, where it talks about if you have issue with someone, the, the biblical route to actually dealing with differences or challenges that when you have with someone um, it says go and talk to the person first they don't do that at all but they don't even start saying to people around them well we've got problems with Moses's choice of wife they're actually more subtle about what they do they they begin to undermine people's confidence in the person of Moses they're like he's not the only mouthpiece out here God talks to us also Thank God these kinds of things never happen in our day in churches. <laughs> Amen. Never happened in this church before. Never. God forbid. Uh. And you can imagine Moses and Aaron justifying what they're saying. Isn't it really funny how we we justify our dysfunction in our own heads? And you can have them, um, we lie to ourselves about what's really going on at times in our lives. Oh, we're not criticizing, or or actually, they they probably said, we're not gossiping about um, Moses. What we're saying is true. God does talk to us also. But actually... Really, when you get down to the motive of what's going on, what's playing out here is actually something the Bible calls witchcraft. And most of us, when we hear this word, we think of uh, people casting spells and things. But actually, in the Bible, witchcraft is manipulati- uh, manipulation, intimidation, and control. It's, it's trying to force people against their wills to do stuff or to, uh, to actually adjust the course and the passage of how people are thinking 
That is the subtleness of, of witchcraft is. Um, and <laughs> I've got this funny thought going on in my head. I, I just, um, I don't know if this is true, but I, I just imagined in my heart there that some, some of you are going, oh, I never knew that. I'm an expert in this. This is how I get things done. Well, the Bible says actually, no, that is not the way to go about getting your own will in relationships or in businesses and things. There are healthier ways to do this. All right. Um, anyway, uh, Harold Eberly. Has anyone heard of Harold Eberly? Yeah, he's a great bi um, Bible teacher author. He says about how this kind of thing plays out in churches. He, um, he writes this, and I want to quote this and then we're gonna move on to the languages of God. But I wanna deal with this because this is important uh, for us and about becoming a healthy community. Anyway, Harold says this, picture a typical church with about 120 people attending. As the appointed leader, Pastor Bill has goals for the congregation. For every service, he tries to have a message which will advance the people in a specific direction he believes God is leading. However, there's an older gentleman named George in this church, and George thinks the direction of the Lord is completely different. George has been a member of the church for a long time, and because the people respect his judgment, he feels responsible for them to some degree. Because of his disagreement with Pastor Bill, George has been very upset recently. Every Sunday morning, George sits amongst the congregation, critically examining whatever's going on all week long. George cannot keep thinking about the direction he's convinced the church should be going. He even prays daily for God to change Pastor Bill. Um, week after week, there sits, uh, there sits George carrying a sense of responsibility and detachment with thoughts becoming more and more fixed. What's happening spiritually? George is releasing spiritual forces, witchcraft, that not only he is formulating his own ideas, but the spiritual energy within George emanates outwards, having a very real effect upon the congregation. And in our story, Miriam ends up with leprosy. And leprosy in the Old Testament was allegorous in the New Testament for sin. And so what happens when we open these doors um, of dysfunction amongst us, it, it actually causes um, not health in our midst, but brokenness in our midst and can actually open doors to sin in our own life. You're welcome. <laughs> Let me get a drink. I've just cleaned up 50 years of dysfunction in, in and around people's lives. It's true, this is the Bible. Now, that's not to say that if you have issue or take issue of what's going on in a church that you can never voice those things. But there are appropriate ways of doing that. Seeding dissent in the congregation is not helpful, yes? You have conversations with the people directly connected with this. What Miriam and Aaron should have done was to actually go and have a chat with Moses. Moses, I'm struggling with this. It doesn't seem consistent with the standards that actually I've heard you set for the people of God. That's a healthy response. That's what should have happened. Um, but, um, and so God takes issue with this. But that's not the point of my message. But I thought it was useful um, for us. And there's some good learning in that. All right. Um, the languages of God. So God responds. And he... And he endorses Moses as the leader and he chastises Miriam and Aaron for their dysfunction um, and the witchcraft that they're operating in. And he says this to them in verse six. It says, hear now my words. Is there a prophet amongst you? I, the Lord, make myself known to him or her in a vision. I speak to him or her in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my service, Moses? All right, so for the purpose of today, or primary purpose of today, I wanna to talk to you about the five channels that God says he communicates to there. And I don't know if you caught them, but they were dreams, 
Um, they were visions, they were dark sayings, they were direct speech, and then the audible voice of God. All right. I want to run through these. Um, people that have studied the Bible have said, if you remove the amount of times God spoke in dreams to the people of God in the Bible, you would have to tear out about one third of your whole Bibles. Um, God frequently through the course of the Bible is shown to actually communicate key things to the people of God. Um, So Jacob uh, hears God in a dream speaking to him and in his uh, nighttime um, he has an encounter in which he's on the run from his brother, if you remember the story, he's camping out in the desert, he's sleeping on a a stone for a pillow, and during the night, uh, he has this vision in a dream in which he sees um, a connection between the heavens and the earth, Um, and there's this ladder that stretches between heaven and earth, and angels are coming up and down it, and Jacob says, oh my goodness, I didn't know God was in this place, this must be the house of God, Bethel. He has that in a dream. And then um, Joseph, the, uh, Joseph, who's another patriarch in the story of the people of Israel, he is a dreamer himself, and he dreams not only his destiny, but the destiny for a whole nation about what God is going to do in his life. And then if you think Oh, you fast forward into the New Testament. And by the way, I'm skipping out heaps of dreamers here just for the sake of time. Um, But also uh, Solomon, oh, actually before we get to New Testament, Solomon, he has two, uh, sorry, one key dream in his life at the start of his leadership um, as king over Israel. And God asks him in his dream, he says, what do you want, Solomon? I'll give you a blank check in terms of answered prayers. And Solomon replies in his prayer to God, he says, give me an understanding heart, which is what wisdom is. And, and you know the story, I'm sure, that um, Solomon becomes the wisest man in the world. And God says, because you did not ask for riches and fame and fortune, I'm going to give you that as well. Um, and this all happens and takes place in a dream. And I often uh, wonder in my own heart uh, what it is that I would respond if um, when I'm kind of parked in neutral at nighttime, what actually shows up in my heart um, during the night seasons. Because uh, in many ways, Solomon uh, wasn't thinking at the time. He was kind of laid out asleep and really what actually shows up in his dream is what his heart desire is actually about what is actually going on in his heart and I'll unpack that some more in a minute uh, because this is important in in often what God shows us in dreams anyway Mary's fiance Joseph in the New Testament yes Uh, Jesus his stepdad or dad his earthly dad um, he sees an angel doesn't he in the middle of the night, and the angel says, hey, your wife, uh, Mary, or your wife-to-be, Mary, she is pregnant with the Son of God, and um, and so he experiences an angelic encounter in the middle of the night, and he gets some information which is really useful for him, because when Mary comes to him and says, hey, I'm pregnant, but I haven't been unfaithful to you, and by the way, it's the Son of God, Joseph has a difficult time believing her for some reason. How could that be? And so, yes, the, uh, God speaks to Joseph through an angelic counter in the middle of the night. Um, and then in and around the uh, Christmas story, lots of dreaming takes uh, place. So the wise men are told in a dream not to go back to Herod. Um, later on, when uh, Herod is looking to attack um, uh, uh, kill Jesus and there's this genocide that takes place, um, in and around the, the uh, Nazarene, uh, Nazareth community. Jesus takes off with his parents, or his parents take off with Jesus, baby Jesus, to, to Egypt. Joseph is told to do this in a dream. He's then told after Herod dies to come back. Um, Joseph, Jesus' dad, was a great dreamer. So dreams are a common way that God talks to us. Um, and 
I, I don't know if you've ever thought about biblical dreams, but they have two kinds of orientations. They're often external from us, relating to things that actually happened outside of, and, and often they can be foretelling or foretelling, talking about things that God wants to do or things that actually are going to happen. Um, when Jody was pregnant with our first child, Grace, before she even knew that she was pregnant, God showed me in a dream that she was pregnant. Um, and showed me that um, she was going to be a girl. She, uh, he also showed me this strange bath. We used to wash her in this tummy tub, which is basically a bucket that costs lots of money. Um, uh, design a bucket. Um, but I saw in this dream that we, we were washing this baby in this, this bucket, um, and uh, like we didn't even know that these things existed at the time. And he showed me as well that Jody's New Zealand family was around us. And it was uh, fascinating because within a day or two, Jody started to drop plates left, right, and center. And I, we, we determined actually we could always tell when Jody got pregnant because she would drop dishes um, all the time. Um, it happened with our second and our third. It's like by the time it happened with our second, it was like, could you be pregnant? Um, and sure enough, she was. She was pregnant. And, and the dream actually foretold exactly what was going to happen. Um, and it blessed and encouraged us and showed us that actually God was on Grace's life, that there was a plan and there was a destiny. He knew Grace. Um, and then, so dreams can be external uh, from us, but more often than not, dreams are in internal in their orientation. They speak to us, as I've shared already, about our heart condition. They reveal something about our souls. Um, people that study dreams say that even the non-God dreams in us give us information about how we're doing in life. Um, they, people that actually understand or theorize the purpose of dreams is that they talk about dreams being the, the toilet bowl for our emotions where our brains and our souls sift through uh, just how we're doing and it, it, they flush those out of our system through dreams. Dreams are the way that we sort our imaginations and our thoughts. And very often, God climbs up the U-bend of our mind, and he pops these heart dreams into our dream, um, into our, uh, dream life. Um, on one occasion, a number of years ago, had this dream in which uh, I was trying to capture this little girl that was doing gymnastics all around the place, and I would uh, I, I want to try and have a conversation with this little girl, and every time I approached her, she would run off or do somersaults or, or run away, and I would try and catch up with her, and I, I would be saying, hey, I just need to talk, I just need to talk, I just need to talk, and, and it was actually an internal dream from the Lord about God wanting me to connect with my emotions. Our dreams are often loaded with symbolism and the people in our dreams actually aren't anything to do with, with people at all. They're very often symbols of things. And so, uh, so often in our uh, dreams, um, people of, so th the, the male people symbol logic and women symbolize emotion. It doesn't always be like that, but it is often for me. And in this dream, the, the interpretation of the dream was that I had disconnected uh, from my heart. And I've shared last week about how I'm a very heady person. I'm a deep thinker. And in the process, I disconnected from my heart. And actually, God was showing me in this dream that I needed to connect in with my heart. And actually, my heart was running away because it was afraid. It didn't want to actually, um, it, it, um, and there was, I, I was taken through a time of inner healing in which I learned how to connect in with the emotional part of me. God spoke to me in a dream about this. All right. So why would God speak to us in dreams? Um, I don't know about you, but when I think about learning how to hear God, 
I often, when I first got going at this, I would be so often thinking, why doesn't God just make it easy? He's God Almighty. He's uh, king of the universe. He's omnipresent, omnipowerful, omni-everything. God, why don't you just talk to people in a way that they can hear you all the time? Um, and why is it that even if you're talking through dreams, we can sometimes miss what you're saying in dreams? And actually, as I've gone on in um, my faith and my understanding about the ways and the person of God, is that God actually does this to protect us from us because we are responsible for the revelation that God gives us. So there's two things playing out here. So we're responsible for the revelation that God gives us, but also God won't violate our free will. And sometimes when God shows up in grand, and actually most of us want God to treat us like this, and um, and that actually is not who God is. God gives people free choice. He could make himself irresistible to people. I heard someone pray this in the prayer room this morning. Um, Lord, make yourself irresistible to us. And God says, no, I'm not going to do that to you because that would violate who I am and who I've made you to be. I want to leave you free to be able to respond to me. Um, And if I violate that piece of you, then it's not true lordship when you bow or receive me as your king. I'm violating a piece of who it is that I've made you to be. And so in dreams, we're actually invited into this place where those that have ears or a curious will actually hear God speak. Or it would just simply be a strange dream to us. See, those with ears or a hunger to actually hear from God will hear God through different things such as dreams, visions, and things because there is this leaning in to what God is speaking. And I shared last week how God is speaking all the time to us. And so God in his mercy and in his kindness is honoring who he's made you to be and protecting you from the responsibility of not responding to revelation. Sometimes God actually uh, doesn't want to show up in your life because he knows you're not going to say yes, and you're responsible for what it is or not that you do with what God does in your life. Does that make sense? Thank you, God, for protecting us in the way that you do. Um, When I first... Uh, when I first started to dream as a, a, a new uh, believer when I was younger, um, what was quite interesting was God distinguished my own heart's dreams. By the way, they can be useful as well. But God distinguished when he was talking to me uh, from when I, it was just me dreaming uh, by every dream from the Lord would be ended by this voice, deep voice that said, this is a dream from the Lord. <laughs> I wish it happened that way um, uh, yeah, no lie, it did. It would be this, there was this dream, uh, it would end, and it was like, this is a dream from the Lord. And I learned to take note to those dreams. <laughs> um, but what it did was it trained my capacity to be curious about dreams in general. And God actually kicked away those stabilizers. Is that what you call them on, on bikes? The, the kind of trainer wheels, those trainer wheels as I matured in Christ. And he no longer says that to me anymore. But it just seeded in me uh, a level of curiosity around, oh, that was a funny dream, but it was more than a funny dream. God wanted to say something uh, in it. And, and so if, when that happened um, and I had a dream, often the dreams weren't plain to me. Uh, they, were, they were things like this, this little girl, um, this gymnast girl that was running away, and then it would end with, this is a dream from the Lord. And I was like, okay, this, God's speaking to me. I haven't got a clue as to what he's saying. But I would be curious about what the dream could mean. And I would be forced to wrestle with the dream to a place where I felt this resonance in me that I'd landed in the meaning or unlocked the key to what God was trying to say to me in the dream. And and the heart of dream interpretation, I'm not gonna go 
um, into this in great detail today, although it'll be fun to do this in future weeks because um, I, I believe God often talks to us in dreams. Um, but the, the, the key to dream interpretation or vision interpretation is to wrestle and be curious uh, around um, the symbols of what God is speaking to us, to talk to people who are more experienced with us in these kinds of things and say, look, I had this dream. I want to invite you into my dream interpretation process. This is what the dream was, just given the raw material. And then begin to unpack with them what it is that you think God is saying to you through the dream. Um, and what I would say is get yourself some uh, symbols type books. There's a really good one called something or other uh, that I use. Uh, I've got it on Kindle. Uh, let me find what it's called. The, the Divinity Code. And it's literally got hundreds of different uh, symbols in there from nuts through to... Uh, new houses and news and things. And so it has these headline things. And it's not that there is one uh, final definition for everything that is co uh, common in everyone's language. And you have to learn your own uh, language that God develops through these symbols. But it can be a starting point to help you decode your dreams. Um, and often they, they tie in scriptural verses that, um, that are associated with that. Um, but the, the key part, and this is also what I discovered in this whole learning how to hear God, is part of the way he operates is very Hebrewic compared to our Greek way of doing life. And I've shared this before, but I want to repeat this because this is important to you. Um, that... Uh, Greek ways of thinking and learning are, you have a teacher, pastor, he is raised above you, and I have all the knowledge, and I impart to you the knowledge that I know, and now suddenly you learn. Whereas actually a more biblical way of learning is you do life, and in the process of doing life, the things that you derive out of your experiences of life are learning opportunities. Uh, for example, my son went to a uh, a, a soccer game in Vancouver the other day, and when my son goes to school, he still, in the middle of winter, dresses in shorts and t-shirt. And, and as parents, we're like, William, you're going to be cold. Um, and William's like, I know better than you. Well, he went to Vancouver dressed in shorts and t-shirt and froze the whole time. He will now know better. That's Hebrewic in its thinking. All right, visions, number two. Um, like dreams, visions are key within the ways that God actually speaks to us through the Bible. And there's different kinds of visions that, I, uh, that I've got um, that, that we can talk about, but I just want to highlight some kind of common ones that show up in the Bible. Um, and, and this word is loaded with mysticism, a trance. Um, Peter has a trance on the roof of a house that he has, and God downloads some key information to him in this trance. And a trance is, um, is basically um, you are seeing into another wor world. You're present in that seeing, um, and you're, you can see what's going on from you, um, but... Uh, you're seeing in 3D very often, like as you're seeing now, uh, into a whole other world. Um, I think I've explained that well enough. And so Peter has this seeing of this blanket come down, um, and in the midst of this picnic blanket are all sorts of animals, uh, some of which the Jews considered were unclean animals with clothing hooves, um, like pigs and things. And God says, uh, eat. Uh, and Peter being a good Jew saying, oh no, God, I'm Jewish. I will never touch anything that's unclean. And God says to him, no, what I've declared is clean, is clean, eat. And this happens a few times to him in this trance. 
uh, and eventually Peter gets the message. But it's actually quite interesting is that there is a double meaning to this uh, vision. And sometimes the things that God speaks to us are multidimensional. And those with ears or curiosity can actually uh, tease out what God is speaking to us. Because in Peter's trance, what God is saying to him has nothing to do, so, oh, it's not primarily to do with diet, although it is in part. It has to do with the Gentiles being a part of the family of God. So we need to recognize that sometimes when God is speaking to us in any capacity, that there are multiple dimensions to what God is saying. All right, another way that God speaks to us in a vision type sense is a picture. Um, if you close your eyes now, everyone close their eyes, and I want you to think of your favorite dessert. And if you're a savory person, think of a savory uh, dessert. If you're a sweet person, think of a sweet dessert. I'm thinking of tiramisu. And it's funny, when you're thinking about that, how many of you can see what you're thinking about? All right. You're seeing a picture that's generated into your mind. Well, God has the capacity of projecting images or stories onto that screen in your head. That is another form of visions that God can talk to you through. They're pictures or, or little movies that play in your mind's eye. Um, and then there is another form of vision. And when I first got into the languages of God, I assumed that this was the, the preferred vision format for God, but I've only had ever one of these in my life. And that is an open vision that you're actually seeing with your eyes like the world around you now, um, but it's not the world around you. God is actually giving you a 3D vision. I've had one of those in my life. Um, and that was, I'll share this, um, when and years ago I was in New Zealand and it was in the middle of the night and I woke up and I was awake, um, I wasn't asleep. And there laying in our bed between Jody and I was a dead Maori warrior and he had a facial tattoo which New Zealanders call a moko, green thing, and they chiseled them in. And he was laying uh, dead between us. I knew in, my dream, uh, in this vision that he was dead. I knew he was a warrior. And I wasn't freaked out. How many of you would be freaked out if you saw that, yeah? I was completely at peace. And I was just transfixed by the beauty of this facial tattoo. And then he pixelated out. And I was like, oh, that was weird. And initially, um, and I explained my process uh, that went on because I was, I, I didn't, know if that was God speaking to me initially. In fact, my initial thought was, wow, that was a spirit, and, and uh, there was some open door in my life that needed to be dealt with. And, um, and, and I spent a number of days actually wrestling with what I was seeing before I actually arrived at, actually, this was God talking to me, and it was a really powerful thing that God was actually saying to me. Um, and, and just to unpack where, uh, where I got to in the end about what God was saying was, uh, Jody and I had been through a year and a half of marriage counseling because our marriage um, had encountered problems. And in um, the midst of marriage counseling, we saved our marriage and reconnected in our marriage. And actually the vision was God's powerful affirmation to us that the warring symbolized by the Maori warrior had been put to death between us. And actually, in Maridom, uh, Mary culture, um, warrior's honor uh, is, is actually exhibited by these facial tattoos. Um, and they're they hand chiseled into uh, a warrior's face. Um, and only people of mana, honor, in Mary culture receive these tattoos. And the fuller the tattoos are, the more honor the warrior has. And what God was saying to me was that there was honor in uh, the process that we'd been through. And he was recognizing, it showed up in heaven that this battle for our marriage was worth the, the, the pain, the chiseling that had happened in the process of saving our marriage. Um, and actually, God said to me that, you, uh, or he, um, one other thing he said to me in this was that, um, like a Maori facial warrior, we were to never ha hide what we had gone through. 
it would serve as a testimony to people all around us that no matter how bad things get, and by the way, we nearly divorced at the, at the start of this process. We said, we're done, we can't do this any longer. And God was saying, actually, no matter how bad things get in your marriage, it is redeemable. You can work it through to a place of healing, but you're going to have to fight for it. Anyway, that was a powerful vision, the only one I've ever had in my life. Um, all right, so the fourth, no, third thing uh, is dark speech. And in other translations, it, uh, it talks about riddles. Um, and riddles are like parables. They're enigmatic speech, enigma. Um, and uh, Jesus used dark speech all the time in his interactions with his, um, with, with his students, his disciples. And, um, and God's world is his canvas. He's talking all the time. He talks through creation. He talks all the time if we've got ears to hear. And very often, Jesus would pull on uh, these stories such as the parable of the sower and use them as things to invite the curious ones amongst them to, to understand the things and the ways of God. Um, and very often God is talking enigmatically to us and the curious ones, those that have ears to hear or eyes to see, will actually recognize God is talking to us. Um, again, this was around the time where our marriage went through uh, some strife. Just as we were in the midst of the heat of what was going on, uh, in Jody's engagement ring, the diamond got lost from that. Um, and I felt very sad about that, except there was also something, I reckon, enigmatically hidden, dark speech that God was speaking to us about our relationship in that occurrence. It was just a diamond that was lost from the ring, but it was also God talking enigmatically to me. Uh, in dark speech. And what he was saying was, our marriage had lost its sparkle. And it grieved my heart at the time. It's like, God, I'm going to get this back. I'm going to get this back. Um, and during that year and a half where we were getting help in our marriage, um, and we were fighting for our marriage, we recovered the romance in our marriage. And actually, at the end of this time, and I was a student at the time, I bought Jody a replacement diamond for the ring, and I made sure it was a better quality than the one I'd lost. Because God had used it to speak to me about where we were at as a couple. And there are things that God uses as unusual happenstances in your life that if you've got ears to hear, you'll realize how much God is talking to you. I've shared before how so often um, the, the, the clock is a portal for heaven for me, that the, the, um, there, there'll be numbers that uh, repeat, like 222, 111, 333, that will come up, and God is highlighting something to me that is his language to me. 911 is, uh, uh, is a good one. That's an, Help is on the way. Who do you call when you need help? The police or the emergency services. And I'll see it highlighted. And God's saying, I'm sending you help. I'm sending you help. Um, 711, there's another one that often God uses to talk to me. Matthew 711. If you give good gifts to your children, how much more is God going to give you uh, good gifts, you being evil uh, in comparison to God. Um, and um, so it talks about the goodness of God coming my way. And so those of us with ears to hear will begin to see some of the events in life and go, actually, that's more than just an event. There's something on that that God has for me. And in your curiosity, God will begin to speak to you. Um, two weeks ago, the lady's toilet in the foyer uh, the, the sewage line between here and the street blocked, and we had two inches of raw sewage in the ladies' toilet and in the foyer. Don't worry, it's been cleaned and sanitized. If that isn't an enigmatic speech from God, I don't know what is. It's pretty obvious. Yeah? It talks about unprocessed crap. I bless you 
to get good at catching it. How do you know when God is talking through this? It seems like what has happened is unusual. Oh, here's another one, okay? Um, The keys to this building in the last month have been lost three times. Okay, master set of keys. Okay, one time, an accident. Two times, that's interesting. Three times, unusual. So when there are unusual events going on, God is saying, sometimes saying something behind the unusual happenstances that are happening. All right. Direct speech. God says that he speaks directly to Moses. Um, This isn't the audible voice of God, but it's like the audible voice of God, except it's an internal audible voice of God. When God says to you first thing in the morning, get up and go to church, that's the internal voice of God. Or get up and do this. Or get up, how many of you have ever woken with this, call this relative on your heart, and they've not been on their Uh, on your mind. Has anyone ever had that, yeah? Or during the day, they've just been on your mind all the time. That's God talking to you about something. Um, I often wake up with songs, worship songs, playing on repeat on my heart. God is, uh, when I look at the lyrics in there, God is often talking to me through those things. That's direct speech. When I was called to be a pastor, I was in a worship service, much like we had this morning, and I'm standing in worship silently, um, just adoring God in worship, and I hear God speak into my spirit, Maddie, I'm calling you to be a shepherd, Um, and I'm going to take you through a period of training, Um, and he he gave some other things that morning, Um, sorry, I gave some other things in the midst of that direct speech, but it was like God was talking to me, but it was playing on the inside, not on the outside. That was direct speech going on, and actually that was confirmed um, that morning because the speech or the, the, the message that came that morning was from a pastor who was talking about people called to full-time Christian ministry. I had no idea that that was going to be the message, and so prior to that, God speaks to me in my spirit and then confirms it later through this uh, message that the pastor brings. Um, And then lastly, we're nearly there, you've done really well, the audible voice of God. How many of you have ever um, heard God talk from the outside in audibly? Look around, people. Keep your hands up. Yeah. So I haven't. Um, Apparently, it sounds like me. No, that was a joke. (laughs) That was a joke. Um. Uh, we wish God would talk like that. My experience is the louder God seems to speak, very often there is um, trouble, strife, pain, challenge that is associated with what it is that he's talking to you about. When you're called to go somewhere, whether or not it's in full-time ministry or, or, or just in life, the louder he talks to you about that, I've exper- uh, in my experience, it is often a sign that it's going to come with challenge, great challenge. And the reason he's talking loudly is that you will need an anchor point to look back on going, actually, God spoke to me about this without a shadow of a doubt. I've learned to value the whisper of God or be relieved. Whew. The clearer he talks, whether or not audibly in any other way, is often because you need it in life. Um, All right, what do I say? We're going to land the plane. I want to pray for you. Uh, We had a a gentleman um, join our intercessory prayer meetings on a Thursday evening, and he'd never heard God talked to him in in visions. He'd heard the voice of God in other ways. And someone who is a visionary in our midst, uh, uh, it was their birthday, and they see, like they have uh, dreams, visions, uh, seeings, and they prayed for an impartation of the gift they carried to everyone in the room. This person since hasn't stopped 
hearing God speak to them through visions and dreams. There is something impartable about the spiritual gifts God deposits in us. Um, and um, and I, I, I just want to pray just all the stuff that I've grown, developed, evolved in my own life, I want to pray an impartation for people today. It doesn't make me any more special. Um, I believe there are people here that hear God so much better than me in lots of other areas. But that which God has grown in my life, I want to release to you. Um, I'll share this much to you um, about my own experience of impartation was some of you are seers. You literally see in the spirit um, and whether or not with your eyes open or not. I was never like that. I was in a meeting where someone was talking on seeing God um, and they prayed and from that time I started to see in the, the, the spirit dimension um, and um, it's blessed my life. So if, if you could stand please, I wanna pray for you. And if you don't want this, the dove will swoop over your life and carry on going. It won't land on you. So if you don't want this, you don't have to have this. Um, but for those of you that do want this, have an open heart um, to what God wants to deposit in you. So Father, thank you for the, the ways that you talk to us, the things that you've deposited in my life, the gifts, the anointings, the capacity to, to hear you. Uh, the revelatory things, the seeing, the seer gift. Oh, Lord, freely I've received, freely I give right now to every single person here. Lord, um, both in visions, in dark uh, sayings, in, um, in dreams, and discerning of spirits as well. Bah, freely I've received, freely I give. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, Father, grow all of our capacity to hear you. Yeah. I, I, um, I get a sense in which God is saying that some of you have only learned to hear God on one channel. Um, you know, you, when I talk about channels, you know radios have lots of music playing on them, um, but you all have a preferred channel. Uh, and um, sometimes we can think it's the only channel God speaks but actually God has multiple channels he's speaking on. And I want you to be open to intentionally growing other channels in your life. If you've never been a dreamer, start praying for dreams if that's something you want God to speak to you on. Put a journal by your bed so that, or a phone by your bed so that when you have a dream in the night, you could just write it down. That's a way of showing God you're keen. He sees that and he blesses that. Um, what else, God? Yeah, bless people to hear you on different channels for your glory.